Lincoln's stance concerning white superiority and his sentiments pertaining to the moral and intellectual inferiority of blacks merely echoes Thomas Jefferson's belief that, in general, blacks appear to, to participate more in sensation than reflection, comparing them by their faculties of memory, reason, and imagination. It appears to me, says Jefferson, that in memory they are equal to whites, in reason much inferior. As I think one could scarcely be found capable of tracing and comprehending the investigations of Euclid, and in imagination they are dull, tasteless, and anomalous. The moral vulgarity of Jefferson saying that a black person could scarcely be found who could trace and comprehend the investigations of Euclid when he knew full well the stringency of state-imposed, note, state-imposed sanctions against black people receiving even the barest trace of an education is so stark that no comment is needed from me here. What is critical to call out is the presumption of white aesthetic, moral, and intellectual superiority vis-a-vis -vis blacks, and all others for that matter, that course the culture and society of colonial America, the United States, through the Civil War, and is to persist after the reconstruction of the Union. The 19th century was to close with the revalidation of archetypal white superiority in the Supreme Court's Plessy versus Ferguson decision of 1896, which constitutionalized Jim Crow in the United States through the cunning, one may say fraudulent, doctrine of separate but equal. Indeed, Justice Henry Billings Brown, who wrote the decision, was to observe that if one race be inferior to the other socially, the Constitution of the United States cannot put them on the same plane. And where inferiority does obtain, such could not pertain to the white race, which would not acquiesce to a badge of racial inferiority. The 20th century was to open with a, the with a cocoon of racial inferiority drawn tightly over blacks, and close with the unrelenting struggle of black people to break free from it. But the full and complete shedding of the cocoon of racial inferiority has proven to be a task of truly monumental proportions, for it chips away the very foundations of white racial and cultural hegemony. In the 20th century, the beneficiaries of racial inheritance the beneficiaries of racial inheritance carried in the tradition of archetypal white superiority which Jefferson, Lincoln, Taney, and Brown symbolized ever so potently have fought just as hard through a range of direct and indirect measures to assure the persistence of racial advantage. It is in this context that the bell curve must be evaluated. The bell curve anchored securely in the tradition that has just been called out rooms comfortably with Arthur de Gobineau's The Inequality of the Races, published in 1854, and Charles Carroll's The Negro a Beast, or In the Image of God, published in 1900. And I'll be, I'll be drawing the bell curve in the context of now of de Gobineau and Carroll. De Gobineau has the dubious distinction of being the father of modern racialist theories, and Carroll was one of Jim Crow's clarion voices. What then are the fundamental unifying themes of the volumes just mentioned regarding black people? That is to say, the bell curve, the inequality of the races, and the Negro, a beast. Like Jefferson and Lincoln before them, De Gobineau and De Gobineau, Carroll, Kernstein and Murray posit an intelligence gap between blacks and whites. Regarding this putative gap, de Gobineau writes, do all men possess in an equal degree an unlimited power of intellectual development? If it is admitted that the European cannot hope to civilize the Negro and manages to transmit to the mulatto only very few of his own characteristics, if the children of a mulatto and a white woman cannot really understand anything better than a hybrid culture, a little nearer than their fathers to the ideas of the white race, 
In that case, I am right in saying that the different races are unequal in intelligence. Carroll observes, the Negro possesses the erect posture, a well-developed hand and foot, articulate speech, and withal, a tool-making, tool-handling animal. These characteristics preeminently fit him for the position of servant, while the law order of his mentality disqualifies him from a higher sphere of life, a higher sphere of life. The gulf is far too wide and deep, which separates between the mental indolence and incapacity of the Negro, which accomplishes nothing, and the flashing intellect, the restless energy, the indomitable courage of the white, which enables him to discover, conquer, and develop continents.